It was spring, but it was summer that I wanted. The warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall that I wanted. All those colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was autumn, but it was winter that I really wanted. The beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday season. I was a child, but it was adulthood that I desired. To be mature and to be sophisticated. I was middle-aged, but it was 30 that I wanted to be. The youth and the freedom of spirit. I was retired, but it was middle-aged that I wanted. The presence of mind without the limitations. My life was over, but I never really got what I wanted. Now I read that poem to get us to thinking about and to wonder and to examine ourselves is do we find ourselves in any of those words? Does this ever sound like you? Do you ever think, speak, or act like the main character in this poem? Because sometimes we're not a very content people, are we? Sometimes we're not a very satisfied people, are we? We're not always a people that are easily satisfied. In fact, it almost seems like when we pause for a moment, when we really think about it, when we really drill down into how much time we spend content, it seems like we spend very little time of our lives and very little time uh, in our life satisfied in our circumstances, Amen. satisfied in what we have been given, satisfied in feeling like we have enough, either like we've earned enough or like we've been given enough. It's eye-opening when we think about it. For we spend a lot of time dissatisfied and a lot of time far from content in our circumstances. And on one hand, if we think about it, even after we think about just the prayer time that we had, it almost seems like we could be justified to not be content in our circumstances. It almost seems like we have a right to be a dissatisfied people. A people dissatisfied with what God has even given us, maybe. It almost seems like no one, anywhere, in any place, in any circumstances, in any way, could be satisfied in all this. In all this world that we live in, all of its hardships and all of its pain. Is it possible to do what Paul says that he has done? That he is content in all his circumstances? For we live in a world right here, in our very relatively small part of it, in our part of Lancaster County, who just last week we heard of a young man just four years old who has cancer spreading throughout his body. We have loved ones, or quite possibly we ourselves are walking through our own pains and afflictions. We see loved ones hurting with everything from loneliness to depression to addictions and all the like. We ourselves may be suffering from loneliness, depression, addictions, and all the like. We turn on our TVs or we open up our smartphone, and from a local church, we, we still see all these pains of this world. We turn on our TV and we see one of a, a local church right here in our county with children coming home from a weekend of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ only to have them severely injured in a car crash. We're still left with images of the war and pain in Afghanistan, the devastation in Haiti, and even closer to home, the storms that have devastated some parts of America. We see the nation that we live in, how we cannot be content in anything, how we cannot agree on anything, even the most basic things anymore, how discontent and disjointed our nation is. It is a sin-filled, it is a broken, and it is a discontent world that we live in. It's a world that we live in that seems almost impossible to find true and lasting contentment. But friends, I tell you that it is possible. Friends, even with all of this and so much more, even with our own propensity as human beings to be discontent and dissatisfied, there is a way that we too, just like the Apostle Paul, just like he declares as he writes these words from us from a prison cell, there's a way that we can both experience and then live out contentment in all of our circumstances. And I believe that these verses that conclude both the letter of Philippians, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and our study of Philippians, it gives us three places or three sources, three ways that we can think, that we too can discover, that we too can take hold of and live out true and lasting satisfaction and contentment. Contentment that lasts through all of our circumstances. 
Contentment that can last in even the hardest things in life. But before we begin to look at that, let's make sure that we are all working from the common definition. Let's make sure we all understand what contentment is. Now the Greek word that Paul uses here in verse number 11 that is translated in our NIV and in most translation as content. That word could also be translated and it is also translated elsewhere in the New Testament as words like satisfied. Words like feeling adequate, competent, or sufficient. That's the sense that that contentment word that Paul uses gives us here. For contentment is many things. It's more than just a feeling of happiness. But contentment, you could describe it as a peace. You could, you could describe this type of contentment as this deep-seated sense that it is enough. You could describe it as a joy that we've talked about. It's this feeling, it's this um, presence in our bodies, in our minds, in our very souls that says, it is enough. That says, I have enough. That says, this is okay. That says, everything is going to be okay. And it says this in every and all circumstances, even in the most bleak and dark circumstances. To take it a step further, this week I searched for uh, some uh, just one sentence definitions of contentment, and I like New Testament scholar Charles Kelly. He defines Christian contentment this way, and it's the definition I'd like us to take with us. He says, Christian contentment is the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provision of God in any and every situation. Christian contentment is the God-given ability to be satisfied with the loving provision of God in any and every situation. So Christian contentment and thus true and lasting contentment is something that only God can give, we see here. It is a peace that, as we talked about last week, it's a peace, it's a presence, it's a sense that surpasses all understanding. It surpasses all understanding in two ways. One is we do not have words to describe it. We do not have words either in our English language or in all the languages in the world to adequately, adequately describe our God and the peace that comes from Him. And two, it's a peace that comes to us and we are able to experience it in places and in circumstances in our life that we should have no right that we would, without God, have no ability to experience peace. Contentment is a God-given ability to trust in the loving provision of our Heavenly Father. And it's the God-given ability, it's the God-given gift to be able to do this in all, in all fronts and in all circumstances in our lives. It is a trust in the loving provision of our Heavenly Father. And of course, we all know the greatest provision of our Heavenly Father. His own gracious and loving Son named Jesus Christ. And that leads us into both the source of everlasting contentment and into the big idea and the big takeaway from the day's message. Contentment, the key to contentment rests in this. It's our union with the living and exalted Christ. That is the not-so-secret key to contentment. Union with the living and exalted Christ that we have talked about throughout our study of uh, Philippians is the key to contentment. Union with that Savior, with that King. That is the key to contentment in life. And this contentment exists and is available to us in all circumstances. The contentment that Paul is talking about, it only exists through Jesus Christ. It only exists through the gift of Jesus Christ that God has given us. It exists because Jesus Christ exists. It exists because Jesus Christ lives. It exists because of the good news of Jesus Christ. That good news that the Son of God, God Himself, has taken on our flesh. And in that flesh, He's lived the life that we could never live. And then through that life, but ultimately in that life and death and resurrection, He has given us that ultimate provision. He has once and for all, and for all eternity, broken every single chain of sin, death, disease, and all of its despair. He is once and for all breaking all those chains. That is the greatest provision. That is the provision of our Heavenly Father. And because Jesus Christ lives, because of God's provision of His Son, because of the Son's provision of His life, the revelation of contentment, the path to contentment has been given to us. Contentment not only exists, but it is one of the indescribable gifts of Jesus Christ that has been poured out through His love. 
Friends, it is our union with the living and now exalted Christ that is the pathway to contentment. That is the key to contentment in all of our circumstances. Focus, on, focus with me on verses 10 through 13, and we'll begin to see three things and three ways that we can live into this contentment and take hold of this contentment. The first, in ten, verses 10 through 13, is contentment comes when our strength is in God. A believer's contentment or anyone searching for true and lasting contentment, they need to search for it in the right place. They need to find their strength to live out this contentment in the right place. And friends, the only right place is from God. Think about with me what both Paul is saying in these verses and what we also know of Paul's circumstances. Those circumstances that Paul is telling us that he has learned to be content in. This morning or tomorrow or in the days ahead or in the past, you may feel like you are in a prison cell like Paul is physically right now. You may feel like your life is on the verge of being over. And whether that means you're worried about your physical life being over or you just feel like a mistake or a circumstance that is before you, it has for all intents and purposes ended your life. You're in that moment where you feel like there is no way out. You feel like your circumstances, whether it was of your own doing or out of your control, you feel like there's no way out. Well, friends, think about the circumstances that Paul has faced. Paul has faced all of these and, and very likely much more. Paul is in a Roman prison cell. He's chained to another man. He's having to rely 100% on others for even his most basic of needs. We know of the previous sufferings, beatings, and floggings that he has take and, taken and the ones that are to come. We know with his own struggles with loneliness and this life that he was called to live. Paul has experienced all this and likely so much more, yet here he sits in a prison cell and says, I've learned to be content in all this. I've learned to be content in all of these things and all of their companions. Paul says, I've learned that it is through Christ his life, his death, but ultimately his resurrection. It is through Christ's victory that I have satisfaction in all these things. Paul says that it is through Christ's strength that I am given strength. It is that I am given the strength to be able to live out all that has been placed before me. And so I believe this poses the question that I believe these verses ask of us. It asks of us both this morning and every day, especially when we're not feeling so content. If you find yourself discontent, if you find yourself dissatisfied in life, then you need to ask yourself this question. Where are you searching for your strength? Where is your strength coming from? Whose strength are you trying to tap into? Whose strength are you relying on? For whose, from whose strength are you searching for your contentment? Your own? Your wealth? Your stuffs? Your position? Your skills, gifts, and talents? Your favorite political pun, uh, pundit? Because friends, let me tell you, with authority and clarity, and let me echo back what Paul is telling us here in this moment and for our lives. If you are seeking your strength in anything besides Jesus Christ, you are tapping into the wrong strength. You are tapping into the strength that has its limits. You're tapping into a strength that will never be able to give you true and everlasting contentment. You're tapping into a strength that will one day meet its depletion. You're tapping into a strength that one day will come up short. But friends, let me tell you, the strength that comes from Jesus Christ, it is a strength that is without end. It is a strength that knows nothing of being depleted. And it is a strength that is available to you right now as it is available to you in your darkest and harshest moments. So I simply say, tap into it. Take hold of that which Christ has gifted to you. Take hold of that which Christ is setting before you. Know and live like your strength, like your hope, like your joy, like all of these things that we've talked about in our study of Philippians. Know and live like your strength is in Christ. Know and live like all of these things comes from one place, and that is Jesus Christ. Know and live like Jesus Christ has defeated the grave. Live like the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was enough. Because it was. 
live like Jesus Christ has defeated all that sin and all that evil that is in your life. Even your own sin, no matter how great and how many. Because it has. Live like Jesus Christ has died to pay the price for your sin and my sin. Because He has. Live like Jesus Christ loves you and has given you the opportunity at everlasting life. Because He has. Live like Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Live like it is finished. God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, has provided. And He's provided abundantly. And friends, it's a provision that will never be able to ascend its sights. We'll never be able to tap into all that Christ has given to us. But what a joy it is to try. Let's live like the Savior of the world is our strength because He wants to be. He gives us the invitation to be. For there is no limits to the provision of God that is Jesus Christ. So friends, find your strength in Him. The second thing I want us to see from this passage and to take with us it's found in verses 18 or 14 through 18 is our uh, contentment comes when we live in the body contentment comes when we live in the body so what does Paul say you can read those verses uh, that, that are before you verses 14 through 18 what is Paul saying in these verses what is Paul saying to us in the church at Philippi what is he recounting in these verses He's recounting, as he has done earlier, he's recounting in this letter the joy. He's recounting the encouragement that he has received from the church at Philippi. He mentions again that they've sent our old pal Epaphroditus, and they sent him with gifts and encouragement, and, and gifts that will both encourage and sustain Paul. He's recounting how when Paul left the church at Philippi, after he had planted the church and gave them their start, when he set out for Macedonia, He says that even when he set out, when he left the church at Philippi, there was no church but the Philippian church that shared with him in his ministry. He's recounting how when Paul left them physically, Philippi was still sharing in his ministry. Because even as Paul was ministering in another church, even as he was ministering in that another church that was the Thessalonican church, the church at Philippi was willingly and actively participating in giving towards this ministry. The church at Philippi, what we see here and what we understand here, is the church at Philippi realized something very important, something that we need to realize in our lives and take hold of as a church. Friends, in Jesus Christ, there is ultimately but one church. There's not ultimately the church at Philippi or the church at Thessalonica. There's ultimately not Peckway Church or Worship Center, Petra, Grace Community, Mount Airy, Peckway Press, Limeville, or or Bridgeville, or any in between. But there is ultimately one church, and that is the church of Jesus Christ. There is simply one body that we are all called to, which is the body and bride of Jesus Christ. And a big part of the truth of living this church, and, and the truth that it seems like the church of Philippi lived out beautifully, and that Paul is commending them to, is in that church, in that body, there is no such thing as scarcity. For God knows nothing of limits. God knows nothing of holding back for a rainy day. God knows of one thing, which is being the God of abundance. The God that can do anything and more than we could ever ask or dream or imagine. For He is the God that is sufficient in all things and to all people. So we are called to live in this body, to be a part of this body. It's so often, and I say this from experience in my own life, so often we live like God just isn't enough. Yet so often we live like God just not, just not is going, God is just not able to get us across the finish line. We live like God is not the God of abundance. We often, so often live like we have to look out for the me before the we that is the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus Christ. And friends, I ask, why do we do this? And I'm talking to myself as much as anyone else. Why do we live like God's provision isn't enough? Why do we live like there's only so much to go around? I feel like this is important for us to always allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in in our personal lives and in the life of Peckway Church. Because we are called to live amongst the body, under the God of abundance. 
We are called to be united in the work that Christ has set us before us with all those that proclaim and cling to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we are all called to live and participate in the giving and receiving of the gifts that Christ has abundantly poured out on us. So friends, let's be afraid to ever go it alone. Whether that's individually in our lives, let's never try to be a lone ranger. And let's never try to be a lone ranger church. Let's live like we are a part of something bigger, greater, and bolder than ourselves. Because friends, as followers of Jesus Christ and his church, we are part of something bigger, greater, and bolder than ourselves. Let's let God lead to places, to people, and to partnerships that he has already ordained and that he will use for his glory and for the coming of his kingdom. Let's participate in both the giving and the receiving of Christ's richest blessings that Paul is talking about. Christ's blessings that are poured out upon us. So when opportunities, like when our brothers and sisters bless us with the sound system that we've given, that we've been uh, given and, and gave some uh, in response to, let's jump into those opportunities with, with boldness and clarity. And then when God swings the door open for us to do the same for another church like Mount Airy, let's go crashing into that with boldness as well. Let's go crashing into the, to the doors that God is opening and boldly declaring for the world to see that our God has given us much. And that there's nothing short, there's nothing, there's no such thing as abundance in this kingdom. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Peckway Church, never forget that you are not on your own. For we are not lone rangers. We're not just a people that carries out the function of this church that maintain this building. But we are part of the church of Jesus Christ. We are soldiers in his army. We are a part of something so much bigger, so much greater than ourselves. We are soldiers in the army that are set with one mission, bringing forth the kingdom of God. We are part of this indescribably intricate, yet this explosively massive redemption plan that God is redeeming in our lives and in our worlds. And friends, in this plan of redemption, in the work of the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ. We don't have to live like we are on our own or like there's something called scarcity. Because we are not on our own. And God has poured out rich and bountiful blessings upon us and upon our church. And friends, we don't have to live like mere survival is our goal. For remember what Jesus declares to us in John 10.10. 10, that he has come not that we can survive, but that we can have life and life abundant. So let's live, brothers and sisters, let's live into this life, Peckway Church. Let's live for the world to see that our strength comes from Jesus Christ, and this strength, it is never ending, and it is never ceasing. Let's live like the kingdom of God is coming, because friends, it is. Let's live like our contentment comes from everything that we say and do being done for the glory of God the Father. That leads us into the third thing that I want us to see, and it's found in verses 19 through 23. Contentment comes when everything that we say, do, or think is done to the glory of God the Father. Contentment comes when everything we say and do is done to the glory of God the Father. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is pulling the strings of our lives and of our worlds. He's making all this happen. He calls us to get up this morning, He's placed us in our circumstances and our lives to be in this very moment, either joining us online or, or in person. Either as the opportunity this morning, as the opportunity always exists, either for the first time to call out to Him as Savior and Lord, or to continue to grow deeper in our relationship with Him as our Savior and Lord. Think about all that God has brought you through to get you here. All that God has brought you through, both those good times and those hard times. Those hard times in the church and those hard times in your lives, yet God has got you to this moment. He's provided a way through all of that. He's gotten us here. We are here. We are alive. God has provided Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ still sits on the throne. Amen? Amen. God has brought us here, though, for a reason. 
And that reason is for everything that we say and do to be done to His Father's glory. You know why? Because that is what Jesus Christ has done for us. We are called to follow Jesus Christ. In, and in following Jesus Christ, we are called to make our lives about His Father, His kingdom, and His glory. Our Heavenly Father has given us something that is worthy of devoting our lives to His glory and His proclamation. And friends, we can do this as Paul reminds us in verse 19 because of the riches of gifts and blessings that have been freely given to us in Christ Jesus. We can do this again because our strength is from Christ Jesus. Now, I love benedictions. Actually, one of the hardest parts of preaching has been picking what benediction each week to, to end our service with. Benedictions are just blessings that are stowed upon, bestowed upon us through Christ Jesus. And here Paul gives us two wonderful benedictions in these short verses. He says first that we have the privilege to do everything to the glory of God. And then in verse 23 he says that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. With two glorious, wonderful, and awe-inspiring truths that Paul reminds us here. And I believe that summarize the entire book of Philippians. For everything that we say and do, friends... It should be done to the glory of God. We have the opportunity to live as God has exemplified for us in His Son, Jesus Christ, as God has revealed to us in His Son, Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to live as if Christ really is our life, if, Christ, if to live is Christ and to die even is gain because of Christ. We have the opportunity to live out what Paul has beautifully described for us in this letter. We have the opportunity to follow Christ and laying down of our treasures, to follow Him as a humble servant for the sake of others and for the sake of the world. We have the opportunity to be His model servants here on earth. We have the invaluable gift of being able to turn to Him in everything, both the good and the bad, and turn it all over to God. We have the source of joy that we've talked about. We have the opportunity to win the battles of the mind that we talked about last week that come only through Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity of knowing and living like Jesus Christ is at the helm of our lives. And in this, we have the opportunity, we have the key to contentment in life, which is the resurrected and exalted Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity to live as if Jesus Christ is near. Because He has come near. And that is what it means to do everything to the glory of God the Father. And to do it forever and ever. To live as if Jesus Christ is near. To live as if the King and ultimate authority of the universe is right there by your side. It changes the way you live. And this is a truth that we live out every single day and every moment of our lives. And think about this with me. Verse 23, Paul says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Friends, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with us. And what a gift. What a gift of indescribable value it is. Because, and again, think about this with me. Even with as beautifully as Paul has laid out the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way that we are called to live it out, how he laid it out for the church at Philippi and how he laid it out for us, how we are called to follow in the humble example of our Savior, how beautifully Paul has done that. We know that we will not be perfect in this mission, right? We will not be purpose perfect in this calling. We know that even after spending two months in one of the most powerful pieces of Christian literature that has ever been written, we will not be perfect in living for the glory of God the Father. We know that there will come times where, we'll, where that are hard, times that are difficult, and times that we will revert back to living as the world lives. We know that hard times and obstacles will come. And so what a joy it is to know that we always have at our disposal the indescribable, the unending grace of Jesus Christ. Because, friends, I, I don't know about you, but I need it every hour and every day. And praise God, even for me, the grace is always, always sufficient. And praise God that for you too, His grace is always enough. For God, again, knows nothing of insufficiency. God knows nothing of leaving us dissatisfied. 
God knows nothing of leaving his people disconnect because he has provided all that we could, all that we would, or all that we should ever need, and his name is Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God for this gift of indescribable value. Now, we've covered a lot of ground in our study of Philippians. We've done a deep dive into the servant-like, humble mindset of Jesus Christ. We've discovered where real and lasting joy flows from. We've discovered how we can win the battles of our minds. We've discovered that we have the everlasting and ongoing invitation to turn all of our burdens and anxiety over to Jesus Christ. We've seen the invitation that we have to turn everything to Christ. And so this week I, I ask God, what should be our takeaway from today's message and also from this entire series? And I just kept coming back to that one sentence. The Lord is near. Friends, the Lord has come near to you. As I said last week, if I was forced to describe the gospel of Jesus Christ in a sentence, I'm not sure I could do better than what Paul says right there. The Lord is near. Jesus Christ is here. He is near and he is in this moment extending an ongoing invitation into his kingdom. And that's an invitation whether you sit here today or you're joining us online and you need to take that first step into the kingdom, which is confessing him as Savior and Lord. Or if you sit here today feeling led to take a step deeper into the kingdom by diving deeper into the heart, mindset, and attitude of our Savior. Friends, I tell you the truth, wherever you are, the Lord is near. Think about the power of that sentence. For all of our sin, for all of our sin that caused all of our suffering, all of our anxiety, it all stems from the fact that our sin has separated us from God. For once we were banished from the garden, but most importantly we were banished from the presence of God because of our sin, because of the world's evil, and because of all of our suffering. For in that moment the Lord was far from us because of our sin. But thanks be to God, that moment is over, my friends. Through Jesus Christ, the Lord has come near. Through Jesus Christ, that sin that once separated us from God, it is now separated, uh, separated from us as far as the east is from the west. Now the separation that exists is not between us and God, but between us and our sin, evil and suffering. Friends, God has come near to every sinner. God has come near to every broken heart. God has come near to us in all of our suffering, in every one of our circumstances. God has come near to us in this life, and praise be to God, He has given us new life. He has given us life and life abundant. So friends, let's live like it. Let's think like it. Let's talk like it. Let's give like it. Let's receive like it. Let's serve like it. Let's pray like it. Let's preach like it. And let's witness like it. Let's be a church and a people who lives like God is our provision. And be a church and a people that live like all that we have ever need or receive. It has been given to us in Jesus Christ. And let's witness to the world that all they could ever need or receive has been given to them in Jesus Christ. Friends, the Lord has come near. Write this truth on your hearts and minds and know that in all things, in every circumstance, in every situation, God will meet your needs according to the riches of glory that he has set before us in Christ Jesus. What beautiful words, what a beautiful truth, and what a praiseworthy Savior. The Lord is near. Thanks be to God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, as we've already prayed and have already spoken about, so much in this world that can drag us down, so much in our world that tries to take away our contentment, that tries to tear us away from the joy, from the peace, from the place in your kingdom that you've set before us and placed us in, Lord. So many places that try to tear us away from the foundation that you have set us on, Lord. But Lord, we praise you that in all things you are sufficient. That in all things you are the overcomer, Lord. That in all things you have set before us life and life abundant. Lord, we praise you today for the richest of blessings that you have set before us in your Son, Jesus Christ. 
praise you today for the riches of blessing that you are also setting before the world, Lord. And so, Lord, as we go forward as a church, as we go forward seeking to help people know and follow your Son, Jesus Christ, write on our hearts, write on our minds, take away these truths that you declare through the book of Philippians to us, your word, write it on our hearts. Make it the mindset of our hearts and minds. Make it the attitude that we live our lives following, Lord, and print these truths on our hearts. And Lord, as we go forth, help us to proclaim these truths to the world. Help us to do this through the rest of this service, through the worship services that we'll have in the future, through Wednesday night when we have the opportunity to connect with countless individuals and countless individuals that don't know of the key to contentment in life and don't know of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us in all things to be a witness of this truth and help us to in all things and in all circumstances find our trust, find our hope, find our joy, and find our contentment in your son. Lord, thank you for the riches of blessings that he has poured out. And we pray all these things in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I'll invite you to stand and sing hymn number 539 that is in your book.